<laughs> so welcome, this is our last talk in the How To Talk series this year, and it's presented by Dr. Sarah Thomas. If y'all came to the scientific presentations talk, which I can't remember the long title, but we talked about how to give a great presentation, then you, she's a familiar face to you. If not, Dr. Thomas went to JMU and then got her PhD at the University of Georgia, and now she studies Ewing sarcoma in the Department of Pathology here as a postdoc at BCU. Today she's going to talk about understanding and performing chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP, and then PCR. Okay? So, there we go. All right. Thank you so much, Stacey. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I think it's just turning afternoon. Thank you for coming today on a slightly cold, chilly Monday. Um, so, without further ado, let's get started. So, as Stacey said, and this has kind of already gone through a little bit of the details, but I went to James Madison University. I'm from Virginia. I went to James Madison University where I got my bachelor's in biology, where I studied neuroscience. Then I went to the University of Georgia where I studied uh, drug discovery and uh, parasitology at, uh, uh, during my time for my dissertation. And then now I'm currently a postdoc in the Department of Pathology where I study a pediatric cancer called Ewing sarcoma. And, uh, and we're interested in the protein degradation pathways that primarily affect uh, that type of cell. So my experience with CHIP uh, has been uh, very limited because based on my own, I guess, research questions. Uh, I've been performing CHIP, CHIP qPCR, for about a year, and there are multiple ways to perform CHIP. And I don't want to give you the impression that I'm going to be able to cover all of them. I will not. Most of this talk will be focused mainly on my own experience. However, um, having read enough about the other forms of CHIP, I can definitely say that there are certainly principles of uh, application and analysis that will be translatable to other aspects, to other forms of CHIP. So hopefully you will glean something from this if you're doing other forms of CHIP. All right, so a little roadmap to tell you where we're going to go on this journey. Um, first, I want to give a little background on chromatin itself and CHIP, and as well as provide just a summary in, in the form of a flow chart of what CHIP, what all the steps of CHIP are, and then go step by step through the protocol and talk about in detail the steps for planning, steps for um, the rationale, like why we're selecting one thing over another, and other considerations, again, per step. And then, of course, some final thoughts. We'll look at some data at the end and some final thoughts and additional resources for you. All right, so what is chromatin? So DNA, nuclear DNA, this, is all, this talk is all in the context of eukaryotic cells. So if anyone working with bacteria, I can't help you, but eukaryotic cells and nuclear DNA. Um, nuclear DNA will bind to and wrap around uh, proteins. To, that form, uh, to form complexes. The proteins are called histones and the complexes are called nucleosomes. Um, the, uh, the complex of proteins that forms between DNA and protein is called chromatin. But chromatin also contains RNA, RNA bound to the DNA. I will tell you right now, we're not going to talk about the RNA bound to DNA, we're just going to focus on the protein bound to DNA, which is just something interesting to consider about chromatin. So what are the functions of chromatin? And in other words, why do we even care to research it or study it? Well, for one thing, uh, chromatin serves as a storage, a uh, functional storage uh, unit for DNA in the cells. It's easier to tightly compact something as opposed to just laying, all in a, laying it all in a pile. Two, uh, to stabilize DNA during, especially when it's physically being manipulated, such as during mitosis or meiosis, you have to organize that DNA and separate it without damaging it. Putting it in a nice compact uh, package makes it easier and more efficient. And then, of course, controlling RNA uh, transcription and DNA replication. We can think of the proteins that bind to DNA as really uh, uh, taking up space on the DNA, preventing other proteins like... <coughs> DNA replication proteins, DNA polymerases, helicases, transcript uh, transcriptional factors, all of these proteins are limited because they can't bind to DNA if something's already bound there, like a histone. So in a way, the proteins like histones that bind to uh, DNA and form the chromatin will, um, in that way, control the, uh, these key uh, pathways in the cell. So what is a <coughs> chip? So CHIP is a versatile technique that measures interactions between DNA binding proteins and the DNA, and this is all happening within the cells. So I guess you consider in vivo. Chromatin is fragmented into smaller pieces. So you have protein bound to DNA, 
cut up into smaller pieces, the DNA, and the protein of interest is immunoprecipitated or pulled out of solution with an antibody. Examples of proteins that you can pull down are histones and histone, modifi histone <coughs> modifications, transcription factors, that's where a lot of my work has been on, uh, polymerases and nucleases, basically anything that you can to DNA. DNA bound to the protein of interest is then, so we've pulled out, we've pulled out our select protein bound to a select piece of DNA. We then uh, isolate and identify that piece of DNA. And ultimately, the purpose of CHIP is to analyze the presence of a chromatin-associated protein at a particular locus or loci. All right, so what are the general steps of CHIP? Well, first, you have to collect your cells. In my, uh, in my case, I work with uh, cells in culture. So I grow Ewing sarcoma cells in cell culture uh, plates, and I harvest from, straight from a plate. I know that in some cases there are tissues that can be collected, such as tumors. <coughs> but in any case, the cells that you need to collect, you have to have a number in mind. So we're going to talk about planning. How many cells do I need for my chip experiment? Then, from there, you cross-link the DNA to the protein with a fixative. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, there are other forms of chip that do not involve fixation. I'm not going to talk about them today, but just to let you know that it does exist. It's called N, as in native uh, chip. We are going to be talking about X chip, X as in cross-linking. So then, once the DNA and, uh, DNA and proteins of the chromatin are cross-linked, we will lyse cells, then fragment the chromatin into smaller pieces, then the, the chromatin fragments are then exposed to, um, they are mixed with antibody and a special bead that will also bind to your antibody so that it will allow you to selectively pull out your protein of interest bound, cross-linked to your DNA piece of interest. And uh, in this process is known as IP or immunoprecipitation. We'll definitely go into detail about that. And then following this, now you have your protein and DNA bound to the beads. We'll talk about how. Um, you're going to wash and elute, selectively elute things that are bound to the column, then reverse the crosslinks, again, connecting your protein to your DNA, then you're going to digest any RNA or proteins that you have remaining, then isolating the DNA, and then analyzing the DNA. Now, there are a few ways to analyze. One is, uh, the one that I will focus on, as the title definitely tells you, is by qPCR, but there are other methods depending on your question. The, the, uh, the advantage of qPCR versus DNA microarray and DNA sequencing is that it's much cheaper and it's pretty fast and pretty easy to learn. The disadvantage is that you can't, you have to have a specific genetic locus in mind to search for because you have to make the primers checking for whether that sequence is present. With microarrays and sequencing, you have a lot more leeway <coughs> to ask, well, what did I pull down? Let's identify it without even knowing what locus to look for. But that's not what we're doing with QPC. <coughs> you already have a locus in mind. Is the protein at this locus? Yes or no? And then you can ask your question. Okay, so let's, that's the general, uh, I guess, flow chart. So now we're going to go step by step. So how many cells will I need? This, uh, the answer to this question largely depends on your protein target of interest uh, abundance. So histones are very, very abundant, and therefore you may not need as many cells versus if you have a transcription factor that's much, much less abundant. You may have to have more chromatin. Um, Generally, you're going to have to rely on the literature to kind of give you an idea. Most protocols that I see start with about 1 to 5 million cells per IP. So to translate that to tissue, from what I've seen in protocols, it's anywhere from 20 to 35 milligrams of tissue, or 2 and a half to 20 micrograms of chromatin. And again, this is per IP. So now that we're talking about IPs, in every experiment, generally, you're going to have, of course, your, your IP for your protein of interest. That's your question. You're also going to have a negative control. And we'll talk more about the details later, but this is essentially an antibody that's not going to specifically bind to your protein of interest. It's basically for background. And then you have to have a negative control. And then there is a positive control, which, um, which will serve to uh, basically tell you whether your technique is actually working. Okay? You may or may not have to have a positive control in every experiment. I like to, but you minimally have to have, for every sample, a negative control and your protein of interest IP. So that means that you're going to need not just one to five million cells, you're going to need to double that per sample. Okay? So this is where you're planning of how many cells do I need. You're going to have to do the math and figure it out. Okay, so we've, we've come up with a number. I typically work with three times ten to the six per IP, at least for right now. Been playing around with it. Um, the next step, now that we've 
collect, we've got, I've got my cells plated, I've treated them, I'm ready to collect. Now I need to cross-link the chromatin. To do this, um, I want, the reason why I want to do this is I want to preserve the binding between my protein of interest and the DNA. And so to do this, I'm going to use a fixative. Commonly, this is formaldehyde. Okay, so formaldehyde solutions are usually, are almost exclusively in this context, they are made fresh. If you make them, commonly you will use paraformaldehyde, which is a, a, a polymerized form of formaldehyde. You're going to dissolve it in water and a few other things, or in PBS, and then, um, and, and then use it immediately. You don't store it because it can oxidize with the air. It doesn't have a long shelf life. Because of that, you don't want it to oxidize. It'll form formic acid, ruining the pH, affecting your fixation. So you have to make it fresh. If you don't want to make formaldehyde fresh, then you can purchase it. Uh, I have some uh, pictures of some ampules you can buy. Um, the issue, though, is that they need to be single use. Again, once you use them, you lose them. And then, uh, of course, they need to be methanol free. There are a lot of formaldehydes on the market that contain methanol. That's a common, they either add it as a preservative or it's a common contaminant. You do not want methanol in your formaldehyde. Pair formaldehyde naturally doesn't have methanol. So when you make your solution with pair formaldehyde, it won't have methanol in it. Methanol can definitely um, significantly affect the uh, conditions of fixation because it's completely different um, from, <coughs> from the fixation of formaldehyde. It basically crowds out the water, forcing proteins to aggregate. You don't want that to happen. Okay, so cells are typically, in most protocols I've seen, cells are fixed in a concentration, a final concentration of 1% formaldehyde at room temperature. Sometimes with agitation, sometimes without, but normally 1% formaldehyde. Now, fixation time, that's what normally you'll see some variation in depending on the protocol. The amount of time you fix is very, very important. Um, under fixation can mean that your DNA just isn't bound tight enough to your protein, so you'll lose it during the washing and all the processing. Over fixation can mask your protein epitope, so now your antibody can't really find its uh, epitope anymore. It can reduce shearing efficiency when we start cutting up DNA. Um, later on with sonication, overfixation is going to affect that efficiency, and it could be, and it, it's often more difficult to reverse the cross links, which we would do later on if you've overfixed. Most protocols I see, and it's going to depend on your cells, but most protocols I see recommend 10 minutes or less. Okay, and you can and you can play around with that to see um, what is best for your cells. Um, I will point out that that's a this the 10 minutes or whatever number you pick. That's a very strict time point. This is not a very flexible time point. You set your time, I set my timer for nine minutes and 10 minutes. At nine minutes, I'm walking over. I've got everything ready to go because the next step is to add my glycine, which is going to quench the reaction. It's going to basically soak up all that free paraformaldehyde and stop the fixation process that had that from, from a continuing. Okay, so you set your timer, you follow it exactly. If you're late, write it in your notebook just in case, um, but just note it because this is a very strict time point. And in fact, during the fixation and the quenching, these are all strict time points. After fixation, cells can be frozen, um, washed, collected, frozen, and stored at minus 80. And, or, they can, or you can just work with them fresh, like fix them and then proceed. I will point out that whatever you decide, be consistent. So if you typically work with frozen cells in the following steps, work with frozen. If you commonly work with fresh, work with fresh. And if you change it, note it in your notebook. Because fresh versus frozen can uh, affect the shearing efficiency during um, when you're fragmenting your chromatin. What? Okay, yes? What concentration of glycine do you use? Um, I believe, oh goodness, I think it's in the 100 millimolar range. I think it's like 1.25x. I believe it's... 25 millimolar. 25 millimolar? Okay. 125. 125, okay, thank you. I was close. I said around 100. Yes. So it, this should be specified in most protocols, but yes, 125 millimolar. <coughs> All right. So after you've fixed your cells, if they're frozen, pull them out, put them on ice, wait for them to fall a little bit. Now you need to lyse them. Break up, and you, the purpose of lysing is to not only break open um, the cells themselves, but also to release the chromatin. So you're going to want to break up plasma membranes and nuclear. Um, not all detergents are created equal. There are denaturing versus non-denaturing detergents, meaning they're going to interfere with protein-protein interactions, which may not be a bad thing. And then there are ionic versus non-ionic detergents, meaning that some are charged, the ionic versus not charged at all, non-ionic. So the most, the most common detergents that I've seen in CHIP protocols are SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, 
Triton X100 and NP40, or non-adept 40. Triton X100 and NP40 are, are termed milder detergents. They're non-ionic, so not charged, and they're non-denaturing. <coughs> the advantage is that their presence has, has, is less risky in terms of affecting your immunoprecipitation later. Remember, IP, where you're going to be allowing your antigen to bind to antibody, these are all non-covalent, um, often charged, well, typically charge-based interactions and hydrophobic interactions. So you don't want to interfere with that with something that's going to be charged or, um, or overly denaturing. That being said, um, Triton X and MP40 have a disadvantage in that they are poor lysers of the nuclear membrane. So the protocol that I use actually does use SDS. I just work around it by diluting it later. So SDS is a harsher detergent um, because it's ionic and it's denaturing. It doesn't discriminate between membranes. It'll, it'll lyse plasma, it'll lyse nuclear, it'll lyse everything. And so the advantage is that it can lyse the nuclear membrane very well. It's charged and, charged and denaturing properties can actually help reduce background binding to the column and knock off any uh, carriers that are bound to the protein bound to your DNA. The disadvantage is that it can and will interfere with the, uh, the, intera the non-covalent interactions that you have between your antibody and antigen. So it's something to keep in mind when you're working with SDS. What's the concentration I have in my IP? We'll talk about that in a minute. So we've lysed our, typically I lyse at 1% uh, SDS. I've seen other protocols where they'll have SDS and Triton X100. It depends on, I guess, how well of a binder your antibody is to its protein of interest. It's going to depend on a lot of factors, so you might have to play around with it. But just remember that SDS is the more harsher detergent, but you kind of need it to really um, to lyse your... Uh, there are other methods of lysing the nuclear membrane, but it's just a very easy, quick one. Okay, so you've lysed your cells. Now it's time to fragment the DNA. Chromatin must be fragmented into smaller pieces because in order to pull your proteins bound to DNA out of solution, it can't be in a large hunk. You have to have small, easily, easily bindable pieces. So to do this, you can do it <coughs> enzymatically with a micrococcal nuclease, um, but I choose to do it through sonication, which is using sound energy to break up the, the, the chromatin into smaller fragments. Here I have two different sonicators shown. One is a probe-based sonicator on the left, and here, what you would do is you would take your tube of sample, insert the probe into your sample, sonicate for a few seconds, and then put it on ice. And then wait, and then do the sonication again, put it on ice. Always remembering to put the sample and keeping it cold on ice, because sonication generates heat, and heat can denature your proteins, destroy your DNA, and destroy your experiment. So you've got to keep that sample cold. The sonicator on the right is the one that I use that's actually a little fancier. Um, it has a water-cooled... Um, chamber located in, the, in this front portion uh, protected by a little bit of plastic and so I can sonicate while the chamber is kept cold with water um, but in either case the sample is still kept cold it's just one with the probe you have to do it yourself with the sonicator on the right the machine does it for me so most protocols recommend fragmenting your chromatin between 200 to 1,000 base pairs. And it could depend on, on your sample. I've seen some protocols claim they go as high as 1,200. That's fine. Um, but in any case, most I see tend to shoot for 500 base pairs right in the middle, 200 to 1,000. Um, because of this, you have to determine the optimal sonication time and conditions to get this magical piece of, uh, uh, of fragmentation. Factors that affect sonication are cell type, cell number. If you've got more DNA, you might have to sonicate longer. Fixation conditions, we've already talked about that, fresh versus frozen, and of course, lysing conditions. So here is an example of a DNA gel where a sample was sonicated, and for, let's see here, for one minute, a little bit was set aside, and all the proteins were removed, all the RNA was removed, only DNA. Then the sample was uh, sonicated another minute for a total of two minutes set aside a little, then sonicated another four, two minutes. That's four minutes total. So basically sonicated one, <coughs> two, four, eight, and 16 minutes. Then the DNA was isolated and run through a, an agarose gel. And as you can see, and this is typical, <coughs> at the earlier time points, you're not going to really have much entering the gel even. It's still kind of stuck together. But as you are fragmenting the DNA more and more, you can see this smear slowly moving down, about gradually moving down, so that eventually you're going to have this population of fragments that you can clearly see, especially at the eight minute mark. I would say given the size that we want indicated by the green bars, I would say the optimal time would be about six minutes, at least in the context of these cells 
this experiment, these fixation conditions. The good news is, is that once you figure out what cells you're using, how many you're using, all the other conditions, you don't have to check the sonication time with every experiment. Now, if you change anything, yes, you have to check again. But at least for consistent repeats, you can set your time, determine the best sonication time, and move on. Okay, so we've talked about collecting and planning cells, cross-linking DNA, lysing cells, fragmenting the chromatin. We're not done yet, not by a long shot. The next step is the immunoprecipitation. So immunoprecipitation precipitates or pulls a protein out of solution with an antibody that's specific to that target. This will isolate and effectively concentrate a particular, very specific protein DNA complex from a whole solution of many, 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 many DNA protein complexes. All right, so before starting the IP, before we, we got our fragmented DNA, we, you know, we saw, we were ready to go. Before you start the IP, take a small amount of the sonicated lysate, what I'll call the sonicate, from each sample and set it aside as an input control. We're going to use that later for analysis. So again, you're going to have to have, the amount that you do is typically about 1 to 2 percent of the volume that you use for the IP. So for example, let's say you put 500 microliters of sonicate per IP. So in the pink tube, the green tube, blue tube, 500, 500, 500. But if you want to do 1%, take 5 microliters, put it in your input tube, just one, you only need one for, per sample, set it aside. Normally I store mine in the fridge because I do the IPs at cold. I want them treated the same way. We'll work with them later, but just to note, before you do the IP, make your input samples, 1% to 2% of the volume you add for IP, then move on. Okay, so what does the IP look like? Hopefully my paint drawing skills are on display. So here we have a bead, typically made of sugar or acrylamide um, resin, and from there, companies typically sell them in either magnetic or non-magnetic forms, doesn't matter, whichever one you work with is fine, um, but these beads will come coated, pre-coated by the company, with an antibody binding protein. These are commonly protein A, protein G, the fusion protein of A and G, uh, streptavidin, it's really whatever, whatever your needs are. I will remind everyone that the way these antibodies bind to the, to the, to the proteins on the bead is on the, uh, the FC fragment, so that's the constant fragment, or what I like to call the tail end of the antibody. That is how your <coughs> antibodies are going to selectively bind to the bead, leaving the variable end, that's the end that's going to bind to your protein, hopefully, um, available. So basically what you're doing is you are binding antibody to the bead, immobilizing it. So anything that binds to, the, the, to that antibody will now be pulled with the bead, like an anchor, all right? So the selection of which type of bead you want to work with will depend on your antibody. So if your antibody isn't biotinylated, you're not going to want to use a streptavidin bead. It won't bind. Binding efficiency to ligand is often species and antibody subtype specific. So this is a table I pulled from AVCAM's website doing a simple comparison between human total IgG and rat antibody total IgG versus binding efficiency to protein A or protein G. For human, seems great. Great binding to protein A, protein G. Wonderful. If you have a human antibody, you can work with either one of those. If you have a rat antibody, though, there's weak binding to protein A and pretty good binding to protein G. So I wouldn't use protein A beads for a rat antibody. These are the considerations you need to remember. If you don't know what type of subset antibody you have, it's if it's a commercially available antibody, look it up on the website, call the company. If you have gotten this from a collaborator, ask them, try to figure it out, otherwise you may have to just play around. All right, so quick note about antibodies while we're on the topic. Only use antibodies that are designated for CHIP. Well, if you're getting them from a collaborator, you'll just have to trust, hopefully, that they've made it work, or you'll have to make it work. But if they're commercially available, and there are many, Make sure it's designated specifically for CHIP. It'll say it on the website. If you're not sure, call them. Come on. Antibody binding efficiency can vary a lot. Um, well, vary a lot from lot to lot. It can vary greatly between different lots, especially if it's a polyclonal antibody, meaning it, it binds to different parts of your antigen. Um, in any case, just note the lot that you're working on, and if you see differences when you order a new antibody, that could be the issue. The amount of antibody required per chip, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on your target, but most commercially available ones give a recommendation. That's normally between 1 to 10, even as high as 20 micrograms per IP. I know with some of the antibodies I work with, 
I have, I think, for a histone antibody, I work with two <coughs> micrograms for IP, and for some others, I work with, I think, uh, I think it's 10 or 15 micrograms, so it depends on your target. And the antibody, how well, how good of a binder it is. Check the literature, maybe someone else has used that antibody and they've reported how much they've used. Alright, so back to our uh, schematic of what IP looks like. So we have our bead, it's coated with protein G in this case. We're going to add our antibody that's going to bind to the FC fragment of our IgG target antibody. Now we're going to add our lysate and proteins will selectively bind to our column and then there are probably going to be a few stragglers along the way indicated by the black triangle that are going to bind, but we'll wash those off later. But in any case, this is how our proteins that are now cross-linked to DNA are going to bind. This is what it's going to look like in our tube in cartoon form. Now, a quick note about detergents. You remember earlier I was talking about how detergents can interfere. Uh, if you are using SDS, I said typically you'll lyse cells and sonicate with 1% SDS. From there, you're going to want to dilute. Protocol, all the protocols I've seen dilute from 1% to 0.01% and then do the IP. So that seems to be, and it might depend on your target. If your target doesn't bind very well or binds very weakly to your antibody, you may have to decrease the SDS and go with other detergents altogether. It depends on your target. But for the ones that do tolerate SDS, almost all the protocols I see recommend 0.01% during the IP. Um, and again, it's because SDS will, can and will interfere with the interaction between your antibody and its target. <clears throat> also, um, as you recall, I brought up IP controls. I showed you what your target IP situation is going to look like. But we have a negative, so here's our target of interest IP. For our negative control, we're going to add a non-specific IgG. It has to be the same subtype, but it just needs to be, a, a, so it's still an IgG but it's just not going to target your antibody. It's going to probably target either something that doesn't even exist in the cell or something that's very nonspecific. It's to serve as a background control to make sure that what you're pulling down is specific to your targeted antibody, not just <coughs> any antibody. And then, of course, the positive control, and this is true for any experiment, for your positive control, you want to select something that is going to have the best chance of succeeding. You don't want to pick a challenge as your positive control. You want to guarantee that even if you don't know what you're doing, it's probably going to work. That's the purpose of the positive control. That can tell you that your experimental technique is solid. And so a good positive control for almost any chip experiment, it depends. But in most cases, histones are a great. They're a well-studied protein for a reason. They're abundant, and they bind really well to their target. So. Typically, and it depends on the time. There are many forms of histones. There's modified ones, depending on if it's a transcriptionally active versus inactive region. But total histones in most areas are a great control. So that's what I use, and that's what I would recommend. In any case, you'll have your positive control antibody binding to the bead as well. And then any proteins that would bind to that, uh, to that antibody will then be pulled down. All right, so after you incubate your beads and your antibody and your sonicate, then you're going to pellet beads, um, either by centrifugation, if they're not magnetic beads, or you can use a magnetic separator rack shown here, and these little brown splotches are the beads that are actually kind of stuck into where the magnet is, and essentially you can go in with a pipette while they're in the tube rack and take out any supernatants, leaving your beads intact. So, we've collected cells cross-linked, we've moved through all to the IP, now we've got things bound to our beads, we're going to wash and elute, then reverse the cross-links, and digest RNA and protein. So washing beads is normally done in a stepwise fashion. First, typically, in most protocols I've seen, you start with a low salt concentration. So probably, any depends, but anywhere from 50 to, I believe, like 100 millimolar sodium chloride, then a higher concentration of sodium chloride, a few hundred mil, uh, millimolar, and then a lithium chloride wash to wash away that excess sodium, um, because eventually we're going to elute with SDS. SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, has a sodium in it. You don't want to have excess sodium chloride there. It's going to crash out your, so your SDS later on. So the lithium chloride is going to wash out that sodium. And then the TE, the tris EDTA, is going to wash out any excess lithium chloride that hasn't knocked anything else off your column. So all the nonspecific things are going to hopefully go away, and you're going to be left with your selectively bound targets to their target antibody. Then, um, for elution, which simply means to release whatever was bound to your beads, 
Um, the B antibody and target interactions are going to be displaced by, usually it's a high concentration of SDS, usually 1%. And so from there, we've released everything. The elution will release your target protein and your DNA complex from the beads. I will note that your DNA is still cross-linked to the protein. That's not going to be undone. So we still have my little green dots connected to the red still. Those are still bound. But what SDS will do is interfere with those non-covalent interactions. Uh, uh, which are between your antibody and your antibody with the bead. All right, we just want to get things off the bead. So from there, now that we have your aluates, which are your you know, concentration of elution, you will then perform the remaining steps on both the IP and the input. Remember that input sample I told you to, you know, pull out five microliters, set in the fridge, forget about it? Now bring them back out. You're going to add elution buffer to an equivalent volume. You want them all the same to your IPs. And from now on, you're going to work with both IP samples and input, processing them together to ultimately analyze together. OK, so we need to reverse the crosslinks because we want to release our DNA and digest everything but the DNA. So to do that, um, because I use columns to isolate my DNA, I do digest the RNA with RNA. So if you're using uh, phenol chloroform extraction, that, that, that by its own process <coughs> will separate the RNA from the DNA. So you don't have to do this step if you're not using columns. I find that if you use a column, you need to do this step, but it's pretty fast. It's about 30 minutes from temperature. Um, proteins are degraded with proteinase K. The treatment is four hours or overnight, depending, and uh, for about 65 degrees Celsius, check. The company that makes your proteinase K, not all proteinase K is like 65 degrees optimally. It should still function, but some like 45, so check your company. The one we use like 65 degrees. We bought it for that purpose. Um, Crosslinks are then reversed with high salt and heat, especially the heat. Usually this is about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, incubation at 95 degrees. That's not going to hurt your DNA. The DNA is going to be fine, and you're going to add... Um, 200 to 500 millimolar sodium chloride. Again, your DNA is going to be fine. The RNA is long gone. And, of course, the proteins have now been degraded. Okay, so now we're at the, we're in the final stretch. We're getting there. So in terms of, so we have isolation of DNA, then analysis and qPCR. Again, isolation of DNA is through a few different measures. Typically, the old school way is simply chemically with uh, phenol chloroform. The other more modern way is spin columns, whichever you prefer. It, I've heard some people say that the phenol chloroform gives them better output, gives them better, you know, um, results. That's fantastic. The spin columns are more expensive, but they're faster. So it's whatever your experiment needs. And now we're going to move on to the analysis. Analysis, the final frontier. We're almost there. <laughs> so a, be a very brief background on qPCR. <coughs> So quantitative PCR is a technique used to determine the absolute or relative quantities of a known sequence in a sample. So this is the advantage and disadvantage. You have to have an idea of what you're looking for when you do PCR. Um, DNA from your chip samples, these are your IPs and your inputs. DNA will be mixed with your target-specific primers. More on that in a bit. DNA polymerase, of course. Your DNTPs and a fluorescent DNA, double-stranded DNA binding dye. Um, the one that we use is called Cyber Green One. It essentially is, as you're forming more and more double-stranded DNA during your PCR reaction, that dye that's sitting around goes, oh, there's a double-stranded DNA, I'm going to go bind to it, and that'll cause a fluorescent reaction that the machine will read, and as you make more and more DNA, you get more and more fluorescence. Okay, so qPCR measures cycles of DNA amplification. So each PCR cycle where you have your denaturation, your annealing, your elongation, um, this is going to increase the measurable product with every cycle twofold. Um, the cycle threshold, that's the CT or CQ value, is the point at which the fluorescence becomes measurable above background. So you can see on the graph on the right, um, as soon as you reach a point in the machine where you set a threshold value, as soon as you reach that point, the machine grabs that number and saves it. It continues to measure, of course, but as soon as you're just above that threshold that, that is set above background, that's the number of cycles, essentially, it took to get to that, um, to that number. So if you think about it, if you don't have a lot of DNA, you're going to have to cycle more and more and more and more and more just to get to that threshold. But if you have a lot of DNA, it's only going to take you know, a few do maybe a dozen or so cycles to get to that threshold, because all of your samples have to reach that threshold eventually, if they can. So, what controls should you run? There are a few. So one, if you aren't sure of 
if you're testing like a new, like, is it in this locus? I want to find out. Use a positive control where you know your protein's going to be binding. So think of a gene. Okay, I know that this protein binds at this particular locus. I'm going to check there as a positive control just to make sure that the experiment's working. But now I want to ask other questions like, oh, is it binding here or there? Always include a positive control. Then there is, of course, the negative control where you know your locus is absent. And this is important because you want to make sure that um, the effects that you're seeing are specific to the IP and are specific to um, this protein of interest. Of course, both controls are very helpful in terms of the specificity of your enrichment. And then, of course, there's a non-template control. Um, you don't have to run this every time, but I find it very helpful, especially if you've ordered new primers. Um, and you've never tested them before. If you basically it just means you don't add any DNA, you add the DNA polymerase, the DNTPs, the dye, no DNA, just add the water to bring the, the volume to an equivalent level, and then run the reaction. Sometimes you'll get a quantifiable product. Now that means a couple things. Either A, you have a contamination um, in the form of sometimes your antibodies come contaminated, so maybe you isolated things that came with your antibody, and it happens, they're called hitchhiker antigens. Um, or, more likely, it depends, check your melting curves, chances are it could be a primer dimer. So your primers are binding to each other, forming a quantifiable product. The trick to find that, though, is the molting uh, temperature is typically much lower than, say, a real DNA-created product. It typically, I think it's 80 degrees for DNA to come apart, but for the primer dimers, it's like 10, 20 degrees less. Okay, so notes on chip primer design. Um, primers for chip are different from primers that you would use to determine effects on mRNA levels. Um, and if we think about this, this makes sense because you're looking at different loci in the genome. For your mRNA targets, you're going to probably focus on part of an exon, like exon 1 is your forward primer, exon 2 will have your reverse primer because in the mRNA you've sewn together your, ex your exon 1 and 2 so you can make sure that you're getting a good readout. Um, but if you're looking for a transcription factor, you're not going to be anywhere near there. Chances are you could be in the UTR, you could be um, a little upstream of the transcription start site, you could be thousands of base pairs upstream of it. It depends on the protein and it depends on the cell sometimes. So in either case, you're going to want to check where should I be looking. Don't assume that, oh, I've got, got primers for this gene, that'll work. No, no, no. Has to be a particular site. When possible, Go to the literature and search methods that report, that specifically report the forward and reverse primer sequence. Uh, used for QP, chip qPCR, I don't have experience with other techniques like chip seeks, the other more common one. I'm not sure if the same primers would work. Um, I don't think they do, but I could be wrong. But in either case, check for chip qPCR primers in the literature for your target for your pull down. Um, test primer specificity and efficiency using genomic DNA, especially if you've designed them yourself. You want to make sure that they're, they're working, and if you give it a great uh, opportunity to, to function, like if you give it genomic DNA, it should be able to work. Now, for designing your own primers, a few notes. Take note of the amplicon size. So depending on the size of your chromatin fragments, you're going to want to typically aim for 150 base pairs or less. Uh, that way, if it's any larger, you risk in terms of the fragments that you form, you risk losing the ability to make the amplicon because now either your forward or reverse sequence is gone because you fragmented it away. Again, we're only making fragments that are, let's see here, we typically aim for, what, a max 1,000, sometimes as little as 200. So if we're in the 500 range, your protein's bound, you probably have only <coughs> 200 base pairs on either side of that protein. So you're going to want to aim for some good range, 150 base pairs or less. Transcription factor binding sites are usually located either in promoters, UTRs, even in introns. In any case, many of them have short tandem repeats. It depends on the transcription factor. As you may or may not know, DNA polymerases don't like those. They tend to, they tend to have slippage when, they, when there are a lot of repeats following each other. So aim for regions. Uh, I mean, if you can, try to stick close to those areas where you think your protein is bound. Um, but aim for regions immediately upstream or downstream of these repeats. That's worked for me and studying a transcription factor. But again, check the literature for any, um, for any possibilities. And even if you're not sure if it's binding at this target, chances are the protein has similar binding motifs and there are predictive patterns for where that protein, similar proteins, bind to <coughs> your targets. All right, so ultimately though, CHIP QPCR is a little bit of trial and error, especially with the making of primers. So if you're making them, 
order several sets, like make design independent, slightly modified sets to see, and then test them. Test them on, test them in a non-template control and test them on genomic DNA. Am I forming primer dimers? No, great. Am I getting a quantifiable product? Yes, wonderful, that's the winner. So we have, we've run our samples through the qPCR machine. Now we're, we've done the input, we've done all the other controls. We've got CT and CQ values, which are also CQ values. Now we need to analyze. So one of the most important steps in the analysis is normalization. There are many technical <coughs> variations. Forget biological variation. Um, there's going to be that too. But for technical variation, there are many, many steps involved. You could have more or less chromatin in your control versus your treated. So you're going to want to normalize your samples based on some sort of control. So there are two common methods of normalization. There are others, but these are the two that I commonly see, at least in cancer research. So one is called fold enrichment, and this presents qPCR, uh, sorry, chip results as a fold increase in signal relative to the background, which is your IgG control. The other one, and the one that I typically favor, is percent of input, which is normalization to the amount of input chromatin. And that's another reason why you really have to have that input control. So how do we do this? So here's an example. Don't panic. I'm not going not gonna to be a whole lot of math here. I'm going to walk you through this. So here's an example data set with percent input normalization. So essentially, the top three um, rows are cell, a cell line before differentiation. That's MB, before. And then the bottom three rows are a cell line, same cell, but now it's differentiated. So MB is before, MT is after differentiation, okay? We have, there, each of them have an input, each of them have an IgG background control, and each of them have a, a had a chip immunoprecipitation for RNA polymerase II. The question is, what are the effects on binding of RNA polymerase II after differentiation at a particular uh, site? So the locus was top of isomerase 2 promoter. So we have our raw CT values. These are the ones collected by the machine. As you can see, uh, they tend to be in the 30 to 35, 36 range. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with qPCR, those are pretty high values, meaning there's not a lot of DNA there. That's very typical of cross-linked chip, very typical. Um, you're just you're not going to have a lot of signal from these IPs. Background issues are a big deal because of this. You don't have it. Despite your best efforts, it's just the nature of, of cross-linked uh, chip uh, qPCR. But in any case, um, this is, again, why we have controls. Um, the high C, yeah, I've already said they're very typical. So from there, we have our raw values. Now we have two inputs, one for the before differentiation, one for the after. So to analyze this, we're going to adjust those CT values as if it was the 100% value. So remember, we only ran 2%, right? We collected, this is just 2% of our total. So we're going to convert that cycle number as if it were 100. So to do that, without going too far into the math, the dilution factor was 50. So a log 2, which again, every cycle is a fold increase of 2, right? Every single cycle. So essentially, based on the dilution factor, I added 5.64 cycles to my input numbers, getting me 24.72, 25.03. So this represents like a 100% signal, if you will, for my inputs. I've normalized them. So now the next step is to compare all of my other samples to their requisite input. So that's the delta CT. So the change in CT is calculated for each sample. So of course, if we take change of CT for its own input, that's zero. And then the others have there, so for MB IgG, I subtracted um, from the MB input. For the MT uh, uh, IgG and polymerase II, I subtracted from their particular input, because that's the sample that they came from. Okay, don't mix inputs with other samples. You want to analyze um, only samples that came from its particular input, because that's what you're normalizing to. And as you can see from the numbers, 24 to 25, it's not, I mean, 24.72 and 25.03, it's not terrible, but they are different. So we're normalizing based on what those input values told us was there. They're not exactly the same. <clears throat> and then from there, we calculate the percent input based on, basically, it's the two, uh, two uh, fold of the delta CT. And then multiplied by 100 gives us a percentage value, meaning that this is the percentage that we were able to pull down in the IP of the input. So of the total amount we had, how much did we pull down in the IP? And as you'll notice, it's not a lot. 
that's very typical. It's often less than 1%, okay? It's often sometimes less than half of a percent. So that means you pull down 1% of all the proteins available for that immunoprecipitation. So let's go to a more, a more uh, easily understandable graphical form. So on the left, we have before differentiation cells, the first two columns, and then the second two are after differentiation. So you can see for the IgGs, both of them, before and after differentiation, they're, pretty, they're both very low relative to a positive signal, which is the RNA polymerase II before differentiation. This means, so again, this very tall um, bar for MB polymerase II, this means that you were able to pull down what appears to be 0.8% of your total input. And this is, this is what, eightfold higher than your background. So this is a significant difference. So um, essentially, you were, this is a positive result, and you were able to conclude that essentially your antibody selectively bound to that particular, um, for, the, for the promoter in this case was top y isomerase 2. So you were able to identify that sequence compared to your IgG. Now if we look, now then we compare from our um, before differentiation to after, we can see that the signal is lost. So, and again, this is technically a negative piece of data. This is the, I guess, the, the limitation of chip. You're not really measuring whether something's there. You do, but then if something isn't there, you do, you can, in a limited fashion, draw conclusions from that. So after differentiation, we no longer see. We are no longer able to pull down our, uh, our, I guess, our protein and therefore piece of DNA of interest. And so the conclusion is, is that a second <coughs> differentiation, in all likelihood, um, uh, led to a reduction in transcriptional activity at that site based on the fact that we no longer were able to pull down polymer top isomerase polymerase 2, indicating that it was transcriptionally inactive. You would have to do other experiments, obviously, to conclude this, because again, you're basing it on a negative, technically. Not the, not the part on the left, but the part on the right, but still, it's giving you more information than you had before on what was on the DNA versus not on the DNA. So my final thoughts in all of this. So first, attention to detail and careful consideration for each step <clears throat> will ensure your success with chip qPCR. Optimization and trial and error are part of the process. So plan your experiments accordingly. Selection of good and good positive and negative controls will really make your life easier, especially the positive control. You really want to make sure that in the best of circumstances, can you get it to work? That From there, then you can build from there. Okay, if I can get a histone to work, Chances are I can, you know, make this work for other things. And of course, report key details when you do publish. I can't tell you how many papers I've read where they left out some very key details. So include amount of cells and chromatin per IP. Include conditions of fixation, uh, lysis, sonication, concentration of antibody, where to get the antibody. And of course, methods of normalization. That is often left out as well. So some great resources, I'm not going to read these all to you, but there are a number of resources I have included that I'm, I believe the library will send you a link to this presentation, but you can just Google these terms. You, I don't know if the links will work it when you see the PowerPoint, but in any case, you'll have, you can Google these. They're all from different companies like AppCamps and Cell Signaling, where they go into very explicit detail for their recommendations and tips for chip qPCR. Um, other resources, so online primer designing tools that I tend to favor. There's Primer 3, that's my favorite. Others, I've seen a lot of people talk online about Primer Blast from NCBI. I believe the library can also help you. A lot of give a plug to the library here. If you need help designing primers, they are here to do that. They're here to help you with that. And so um, I didn't know that until they told me, so feel free to contact them. That's what they're here for. So it's like, hey, I, I, I need help. Please help me. They'll, they'll help you. And of course, um, for any questions about the math that I performed today for a percent input analysis, I've included a link to the Thermo Fisher website where I originally uh, got the, uh, I guess, the step-by-step -step instructions for how to analyze. They include both percent input and fold enrichment, so you can sort of judge yourself <coughs> what you prefer. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and hopefully this has been very informative. Are there any questions? Yes. So, Elton, if you get a positive result of one primer set that's to get a specific part of the promoter, mm -hmm. is it necessary to look at the other parts, other of the other parts of the promoter, with different primers? I would say no. If your question is, 
am I able to, if your question is, is the protein binding at this general yeah, locus, yeah, yeah. is it changing, then I would say no, because chances are your primers are very close to each other, okay. very, very close to each other if you're targeting a specific site, so I would say generally no. Yeah, once you have once you have the positive result, rejoice. <laughs> Any other questions? I know it's a lot of information and a lot of steps. I just wanted to clarify um, yeah. the point that you made when you said uh, when you're conducting chip with SDS at one percent. Okay. After the fact, you have to reduce the SDS to point zero one. Yes. One. Mm -hmm. What, which is one hundred. Um, yes. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. I, Pretty high. Yeah. I, I've I've seen one. I've, I've seen a one to ten dilution, but I've never seen a one to. They started at one. They started at one percent. Yeah. They they would start at one percent and then they would end at point one percent to do the IP. Hmm. And, and I guess uh, it all depends on the antibody that. You it have. Could, it definitely would. I mean, uh, I, I, do you remember what they were probing for? Like what they were pulling down? If it was like a histone or something like that, a great binder, likely that wouldn't interfere. Uh, this was general. Thing. Yeah. So okay. it, it was both like RNA pole or mm. P300, you know, some pretty, you know, um, avid chromatin reactors. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to, I, I'd have to look at the protocol. It could it definitely depend. But I mean, I know I've worked a lot with, the, like, lived with a lot of these protocols and. Many of them, at least the ones that I see, they, they recommend diluting um, pretty far. You know, if you're working with that much SDS. Yeah. Um, but in any case, yeah. What about using, uh, as a positive control, an antibody that targets histone protein itself? Yes. Like H3? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. That, like, total histones, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. I, that's the, that's the positive control. You're talking about a positive control for the IP. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then some sort of target like GAFDH that would definitely have, you know, or some, if you're looking for transcriptionally active, that'd be like the site for that, or just almost any other place in the genome where you feel like you'd have a good strong signal in terms of the qPCR. Yeah, total histone, or if you, it depends on your question. If you're looking for transcriptionally active versus inactive regions, you'd want a positive control for a transcriptionally active region. <laughs> For example, but yeah, total histone, absolutely histone, total histone H three, yes. Yeah, so often I see just people using acetylated, like pan acetylated histone, mm -hmm. um, which I guess indicates functional a functional role there for that histone. Yes, I believe it's for transcriptional uh, trans transcriptionally active regions. Yes. Depending on where you're searching, it depends on whether you find it there. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.